Yes, yes, yes. So y'all stay tuned for part two. That's coming up. <clears throat> I like the fact that uh, Jane touched on in the first segment that we are your mothers and your father. And the Holy Bible, since y'all all are Christians, evangelicals, the Bible say, honor your mother and father that your days may be long. So shout it from the mountaintops. We are your mothers and your fathers. We are the Eve of the earth. The black man is Adam. And God fashioned Adam out of black mud. That's what the Holy Quran says. Okay? Y'all don't want me teaching up in here, but let me say one thing to you. Once you understand what the Bible really means and that it's just really symbolic, and you be able to decipher what the symbolism is, you will become a healthier human being and you will begin to respect mankind, your position in it, and you will begin to respect black people a little bit more. Black people now are acting totally out of their nature. And the behavior that you have assigned to them, that you have beat them into, is... Mm, Mm -mm. is a hell that happens when you mistreat somebody. They become, the self-hatred begins to be exposed. Uh, the, the, um, the misjudgment from you regarding us is so prevalent because you have been misguided. You don't have proper education. And so once you get proper education, you will have to humble yourself. Why do you think they don't want critical, don't, don't even want you to do no critical thinking about race? Because y'all existence is weak. And unless you dump it on somebody, as John Travolta said, the, uh, everybody dumps on somebody. Okay, the white man dumps on the niggas. This, y'all dump on... The, the white man dump, um, dumps on the Jews until you really figure out the keys to the colors. <laughs> That's what Dr. Francis said. Okay? Understanding the keys to the colors. And then you're going to find out just how insignificant you are and have been in this thing we call life. And how significant we are and our contributions to this thing called life and to you and everything you've done you've copied off of us you've stolen from us all of it that's the hardest part for white people to understand and like i said in the prior video all white people are prejudiced and uh, like i said i use the word just for white people with black people I don't even consider it prejudice because to prejudice means to judge before the fact. And after living with you all for all these hundreds of years, we ain't prejudging you, honey. We are saying just what it is and how horrible, how horrible of a roommate you have been on the planet Earth. Not just the black people. To even your own people. So what we have to do is we have to destroy the myths. We have to tell the truth and speak truth to power. And we have to be comfortable with that. Another thing that Jane said is that uh, when she talked about her kids eating carrots. Um, I mean eating um, oranges. And that is so true. I used to have horses and I told uh, this story before. And um. In Palmyra, Wisconsin, they used to go up there and we used to load up uh, trailers full of carrots. They had the Mexicans out there picking all them carrots. And I mean, you could get tons of them, thousands. That means thousands of, of carrots for like 30 bucks. And after those uh, people got finished for the summer, they would go back. This is what kills me about this conversation with the immigrants. Because... The Mexicans do st stuff that 
no lazy American wants to do. You didn't want to do it in the first place. That's why you had black people uh, and uh, nursing your babies. You've been lazy. And you had the China man come over here, make the work. You've been lazy. So now you don't want them over here, but who's going to pick the oranges? Who's going to tend to your crops? The Mexicans are doing all types of work that we really don't want to do. And basically, by now, don't even have the skill to do anymore or the desire. Okay? Let's keep that in mind as we go through um, the next part of this conversation because it's very important. Here we go. We, we often hear about reverse racism now. There's no such thing as reverse racism. There's no such thing as reverse racism. You can only be a racist if you have the power to institutionalize what you're doing to people who are different from you. What, you're call, what we're calling reverse racism is natural reaction to being treated unfairly on the basis of somebody else's ignorance. Now, don't ever let anybody say to you or about anyone around you that people don't like that person because of the color of their skin. That isn't the reason pe white people don't like people of color. They don't like people of color because they don't understand about skin color. And they don't understand that we all are descendants of somebody who looked like your mother. That's deep. Um... You, want, you don't really want to get me started on this. because I, I do want to get you started. I'm really angry about what, how we are miseducating the American mind. And, and what, what I like the most about what you're doing in your exercises is that you come in with a very direct attitude. You even call yourself the B word. Well, but you see, the B word for me is the one that's most often used to refer to me. It used to bother me a lot. For me, the B word is an acronym for being in total control, honey. So... And, you want to call me that? Uh, it'll prove to me that you're out of control. And then I'll whip out my little Lorena Bobbitt fruit knife and take care of it for you. Go on. So is it necessary to strip away all of a white person's power, like in your exercises, in order for them to see the light? Or is there another way it's to... Necess it's necessary to do what we do in offices and in the military and in schools and colleges and in hospitals and in community groups all the time. What we do is we become our parent ego. We go into our parent ego state, and that forces all those we're working with into their child ego state. And if you watch our present, so-called president, he spends most of his time either in his child or his parent ego state. He never gets into his adult ego state unless he's reading off the teleprompter. And he is such a poor reader that oftentimes he makes mistakes and then he is instantly in his child ego state right in front of your very eyes. It's absolutely fascinating to watch it happen. Speaking of our president, a lot of people say that racism has risen under, under him. Do you I mean, anybody who doesn't say that hasn't been paying attention. It absolutely has. I'm getting more hate mail now than I have gotten for years. The kinds of things that are being said in this country today are things that he has said for the last two years. He has said them publicly, and he got elected because he said them publicly. We have a group of people in the United States of America who were in response to eight years of a black man in the White House and the possibility that they might have from four to eight years of a woman in the White House will elect anything that walks and can chew gum at the same time. This last, this last election, as far as I'm concerned, was a direct response to having a black man in the White House for eight years. And it's time to change the White House to the President's House. This is ridiculous to call the place where the President of the United States lives the White House. It, gives the, it sends the wrong message. It says, I remember when Richard Nixon said to a group of reporters, I'm trying to save the White House for you white people. That says it all. And at that moment I thought, well, wait a minute. Now this is something that has to be changed, and it has to be changed. Nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. It's time to change the name of the White House to the President's House or the President's Residence, which has a nice ring to it, don't you think? <laughs> okay, let's just say that Donald Trump, President Trump, is trying to bring the country together like he said he would do. He was, wait a second, he's trying to bring the country together. How would he go about doing that? And Resign. If he really wants to bring the country together, all he has to do is resign and take his, what do you call him, with him, the second in command, the vice president. 
That would bring the country together. But right now, the only way he can bring the country together is put somebody else in the president's office. He does not know how to be a president. He does not know what legislation is about. He does not know how to do this job. He didn't intend to get this job. And had it not been for the Electoral College, he wouldn't have this job. Mrs. Clinton won the popular vote. The only reason we have this person as the President of the United States right now is because the members of the Electoral College didn't do what that Electoral College was designed to do. Thomas Jefferson designed that to make sure that no one who was unfit for that office would ever be elected President of the United States. The Electoral College last year absolutely defeated that. With the state of the country being what it is right now, um, there's a lot of conversations taking place about you know, let's have a conversation about race. How would a person go about having that conversation? What can they expect to happen in, in a conversation? Well, like the that? first thing they have to do is not talk about tolerance. I found out the day I was on the bottom in the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise with my students, I found out how it feels to be tolerated. I found out that tolerance means put up with or allow me to be. I don't need your allowance. And I don't need to be tolerated. I want to be valued, recognized, and appreciated. Put your tolerance where the sun doesn't shine. I do not believe in tolerance. Because in this country, we tolerate zits when we're little, zits when we're teenagers, hot flashes when we're old, and the flu and bad weather in between. We tolerate ugly things that are going to go away. I don't intend to tolerate anyone. I intend to recognize, appreciate, and value people, not to tolerate them. And I have all kinds of respect for the man who is part of the tolerance group in Atlanta, maybe. I have all kinds of respect for those folks, but we've got to change it from tolerance because the powerful can tolerate. The powerless have to wait to be tolerated. I have no time for that. I like that. No, I'm going to get lots of angry responses to that one. And I understand that, but I'm reading a book right now. Everybody needs to read this book. It's called, everybody has to read this. Everybody that's watching this has to read this book on tyranny. 20, 20 things that we've learned over the last hundred years in this country that have put us in the position we're in now and what we can do about it. Everybody has to read this book. They should read this book first and then they should read The Myth of Race by Robert Wald Sussman. And once you've read The Myth of Race, you will never ever again go along with the idea that there are three or four or five different races. It was a lie made up by the people who ran the Spanish Inquisition. And before that, there were different colors, but there, there was, race had nothing to do. There, were, there, were, there was only one race, the human race. We made that whole thing up. It's time to get rid of it. We have the power to do that. This country got ready for World War II in about six months. And you are telling me that we can't destroy racism? White people created racism. Anything you create, you can destroy. God created human beings, the human race, and they started out black women. White people created racism. Human beings created racism. It's time to get over it. Uh, can we go back one second? <laughs> you, <laughs> sure you can. You, you criticize President Trump. Did I? One thing that a lot of people have criticized President, former President Obama on was not speaking out on race enough. Do you think he failed in that? What if he had spoken out enough on race? Imagine what would have happened to him. The man is still alive. Do you remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Do you remember Malcolm X? Do you remember all those people have been killed not because of the color of their skin, but because of the fear of white people that someone who isn't white is going to look better, sound better, act better, do better than they do. Mr. Obama was the president of all of us. He wasn't just the president of black people. He was the president of all of us. The man who's there now is and claims to be the president of the people who look like him. When he says, make America great again, what he's really saying is, Make America hate again. We'll continue this interview online. And we're going to um, wrap it up with the part three 
of Jane Elliott's uh, visit to Milwaukee and her interview with um, Black Nouveau and James Causey. Uh, I really, really appreciated it. This is not her first time. In fact, this is the second to the uh, last time, I believe, that she came. So what I want to do is I want to continue to play her words of wisdom. And this is the last part three. I hope you all enjoy it. I hope you leave a comment, good or bad, whatever you decide. Uh, and let's talk about this because it's very important. Okay? Here go point, part three. Oh, boy. Most urban sectors, especially in Milwaukee, remain hyper-segregated. Why is it taking so long? Or why does it seem like people move the button on diversity in neighborhoods? Because the people who have the power in this country are the people who have the money. And the people who have the money are going to decide where people live. You need to realize that there are more children attending segregated schools in the United States today than there were previous to Brown versus Board of Education. And that's a fact. You need to realize that it is not the intent of white people to let this situation change in favor of anyone but themselves. And right now, white people are really frightened. If you don't understand the destruction of Planned Parenthood uh, offices, and you don't understand the wall that we're going to build on the southern border of the United States, you haven't read the book The Birth Dearth by Ben Wattenberg. Ben Wattenberg was a brilliant Jewish man who was a member of the American Enterprise Institute. And he wrote a book, the first paragraph of which says, the main problem confronting the United States today is there aren't enough white babies being born in this country. Wow. He was an advisor to presidents of the United States. He wrote the book in 1987. He says there are, if we don't change this and change it rapidly, white people will lose their numerical majority in this country and this will no longer be a white man's land. Now, I'm not misrepresenting this. I'm telling you exactly, almost exactly what he says. He says there are three things we can do to solve this. Number one, we could pay women to have babies, as they have been doing in Western European nations for years. Yep. Then he says, and these are his words, not mine, unfortunately, we would have to pay women of all colors to have babies, so we don't want to do that. He says the second thing we could do is increase the number of legal immigrants that are allowed into this country every year. Then once again, he says, unfortunately, Hello. the vast majority of those wanting to come to this country today are people of color, so we don't want to do that. The <laughs> third thing, he says, and white men, women had better... We hear! 60% of the fetuses that are aborted every year are white. If we could keep that 60% alive, that would solve our birth dearth. Does that sound like racism to you? <laughs> and if it doesn't, I want to know why it doesn't. Wow. If it doesn't, you don't understand what racism is. And I think it does. When we close Planned Parenthood clinics because we think they're there only for abortion, we need to take another look. They right. are used for many, many, many Thank things that you. many women Thank need. Thank you. The things that they can get from Planned Parenthood clinics. But we are willing like to do away with if you all don't have no insurance. to avoid allowing white women to have control of their own bodies. Now, nobody had better tell one of my daughters or granddaughters Handmaiden's tale. what they can do with their body. You haven't that right. Now, it would be interesting if we were as concerned about sperm cells, huh. wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> we could take a whole lot of fun out of you boys' lives. <laughs> a, a, a lot of people uh, don't understand the trauma associated with race and racism. Can you talk a little bit about the trauma associated with The trauma associated with it? Yeah. One of the main traumas is it tells white people that they are superior because of the lack of melanin in their skin. And then they find out suddenly that we've got a black president. That's traumatic. That's where their trauma is. Living a lie, finding out the truth, uh, is traumatic. Uh. Finding out now, recently, that within 30 years, white people will be in the numerical minority in this country is going to be traumatic. And that's the reason we have to solve this problem, and we have to solve it now. I will ask folks tonight, how many of you black folks want to get even with all white people? And that's what white people are quite certain blacks are going to want to do, is get even with all white people. And nobody will raise their hand. And then I'll say, how many of you want to get even with one or two? Every hand will go up. And you know why, and so do I. White people are scared to death right now, particularly white males. They're scared to death that they are going to lose their power in the future. And they are. But if you want to get ready for the future, if you want to be treated well in the future, 
treat others well in the present. Right. What we do in the present constructs the future. Yes. What we have done in the past, we can learn from that. And we better learn from that. Those who forget the mistakes of the past are doomed to repeat them. And when you read this book, you'll realize that that's exactly what we're doing. We're repeating the mistakes that we have made in the past because we aren't teaching about these mistakes in the present. We are not teaching history that is true. We're hiding we aren't teaching social studies that is true. We aren't even teaching true geography, for God's sake. Have you seen the Mercator map recently? Have you seen that great big Greenland hanging down in the middle of that map like a ripe plum? And have you seen the legend at the bottom that says, South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland? Are you aware of that? Most of those watching this program are not Peter's aware of Peter's projection that. is the map y'all really you need to put on your wall. Times in, in not this crazy shit that at white first supremacy we heard some old things about the wall. Made first, up. We, Mexico was going to pay for the wall. And yeah, but you need to know that 70% of what Mr. Mr. Number 44 and a half said during that campaign wasn't true. And the wall business wasn't true either. If his mouth is moving, his lips are moving, he's probably lying. You know that as well as I do. He doesn't intend to build a wall. We can't afford to build that wall. We have no business building that wall. We would be keeping Americans out of America. What's your question? The question on the wall is, there's, you know, when you talk to people about the wall, to certain people about the wall, there's certain people for it, certain people against it. The people who are for it, what, what's their mindset? They're scared. They're afraid those people, those immigrants are going to come over here and take their jobs. Let me tell you something. You can build a wall, you can build a wall 50 feet tall. And smart Hispanic Latinos, smart Ecuadorians, smart others are going to tunnel under that wall and come up in their friend's house on the other side. You can build walls until hell freezes over. You will not keep that immigration from happening. And you better hope we don't keep that immigration from happening. We need those people. Do you know what will happen to the economy of this country if we take all the people who are brown-skinned immigrants out of this country, if we send them back? Do you know what will happen to our economy? Do you know what will happen to farming in California? Do you know what will happen to the price of your fruit? Do you know how hard it will be to get a good avocado? Do you have any idea what will happen to this country's economy no, if they all don't those brown-skinned people they run off back arrogant. to Mexico? I don't think we do. I don't think people have thought about that. We don't. They because don't. Because they are being taught not to think. They are using a language. Right now, we are using a language that includes words like extremism and ugly language about people who are different from ourselves. People are listening to those words. They aren't listening to the philosophy behind them. They aren't listening to the core principles which this person has none of. Now, um, couple, just a couple more questions. Uh, when we hear, uh, when, I, when I hear people say that they're not racist and and, and things like that, and we talk about building racial harmony in this country. I don't think I see it in my lifetime. Can you predict in the near future or far future when we will ever have uh, racial harmony? Oh in this yeah, country? in 30 years, white people will have will have found out that they have no 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 choice but to get along with those who are different from themselves. I'm not willing. I'd love to wait, but I can't. Uh, at my age, I'm not going to be here in 30 years. But we could change this situation if we chose to. During during the Second World War. We called the Japanese, and you'll pardon me, but this is what we call them, slant-eyed little yellow mm -hmm. We didn't say that about the Germans. After the war, we rebuilt Germany and Japan, huh. and we get along beautifully with the Japanese. That was in 1945 that we finally won that war. How, ma how many years ago was that? Figure that out quickly. I'm not a math person. But You're not a math time. person, but you know it wasn't that far. Right. And it didn't take 50 years for us to, to have peace with the Japanese and the Germans. Even though, even though we dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, the Japanese hadn't killed 10 million people. Nowhere near that. Mm -hmm. We didn't drop any bombs on Germany. Nope. Beca any, any atomic bombs on Germany. They were a different kind of people. We couldn't afford to do that. We killed how many Japanese people with two atomic bombs? And they forgave us. You want to talk about forgiveness? You want to talk about changing this thing? I cannot understand how Japanese people can stand the sight of any of us, and yet they do. I cannot understand 
why black people who have been subjected to the ugliness that they've been subjected to in this country Woo! can get up every morning Woo! and go to work among us and not be absolutely furious. Uh. And I don't understand why we allow white people to behave the way they do. I don't understand that. And my third graders, after they'd gone through the exercise, couldn't understand it and wouldn't tolerate it. And when they went up to junior high, and a junior high teacher used the N-word, one of my, my former students said, if you're going to use that word, I'm going to go out in the hall until you stop using it, because we don't use that word in this school. That was a, sixth, a seventh grader who told his teacher off. When we have enough students who are willing to confront people who are making racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic statements, we're going to be better off. We have got to stop tolerating the intolerable. If it's intolerable for my black cousins and every black person on this earth is one of my cousins, if it's intolerable, if it's intolerable for me, I will not tolerate it. I will not tolerate it. That is not that. I am required not to tolerate that. Kind that's of right. For the people who are related to that's me. That's right. And that's every person on the face of the earth. That's right. If your ignorance is such that you mistreat somebody because of your ignorance about the color of their skin, don't do it around me. Huh. Number one. I've been threatened with death lots of times. Huh. Now I say, go for it, fool. My husband died four years ago. Being with him would not be a bad thing for me. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Living a worthless, useless life is much worse than dying. Oh! Whoa! 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 You living... A worthless, useless life is worse than being dead. How many of y'all can agree with that? How, how many of y'all can relate to that? If you can't, you need your head examined. I want to thank uh, James Causey for bringing this uh, interview. I want to thank Jane Elliott for her wisdom. Not saying that I agree with everything Jane says. But I love her, and I love her spirit, and I don't agree with everything every somebody says. It's like somebody don't agree with everything I say. But what I do is I thank God for her because she's one of the few people who uh, she, I, cut her, I cut her from the same cloth of vile loose who are willing to risk their life to tell the truth. John Brown, to tell the truth about this society and how racism is going to destroy it. I want to know what y'all think. What we'll say you? What we'll say you? Y'all, please leave a comment. Please give a like or a dislike. And help us grow in the algorithms. With that being said, if you like what you hear, please like, subscribe, and share this video. This is That's part two and three. Jane Elliott in Milwaukee. And her take on diverse and resilience. I mean, diverse <laughs> diversity, and um, and just our state of America. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you all in the next video.